Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a This Year in Perfume and we are all the way to the year 2021, which means we're only a couple videos away from finishing this epic series. Uh, I kind of shot myself in, in the foot a little bit with this series because I said I was going to include any fragrance that I have a full bottle of or that I have reviewed on the channel in the list. And as it turns out, I've been a hard working Ram, so lots of reviews have happened. So therefore, lots of fragrances get included in the list. However, um, if you've seen the list swell over the years, um, and I just noticed I don't have my water. We're gonna we're gonna just go right through it because that's how that's the kind of mood I'm in today. Uh, we're gonna push right through. Forget the water. No hydration breaks for me. So um, in 2021, you're gonna see the list shrink a little bit. We're only down to 26 fragrances, which some of these other ones have been 30 plus, 40 plus, uh, 50 plus. And so um, only having 26 feels like we'll blow right through this. Let's do some important events in 2021. Um, no matter what you believe on politics, for me, sitting here in 2024 as an American, the number one sort of story was Joe Biden being sworn in as the 46th president of the United States and Kamala Harris becoming the first woman, um, first woman, first Asian American, first African American to become vice president is how they have it listed on Wikipedia. Um, so no matter what you believe in politics, kind of the, um, as my middle of the road view goes, and this is not a political channel, this is a fragrance channel, but uh, for me, that was kind of the event of 2021 because it feels like, you know, the clock on, on America's decline just kind of ticked faster, started to go at double speed. Like you put the YouTube video on two times speed. Some of the things that he did, um, like I said, for me, this is just my personal opinion, but having the disastrous open border policy, canceling things like the Keystone pipeline instantly on day one. Um, it just, it just, it almost felt malicious against the United States of America, you know, and I don't think any party is right or wrong in this. I think both parties are to blame for the situation that America is in. I don't think anything that could be happening right now could be happening if the Republicans were not kind of rubber stamping everything. Uh, so I think both parties are shite in my opinion, but that is the event of 2021 for me. Um, there were some other things that obviously had headline news in 2021 was the COVID issue. It was the first uh, year that I worked from home entirely. So I didn't have to go to, uh, go to the office to work. I did everything from home for all of 2021, the entire year. Um, and of course that was the COVID hysteria, you know, don't leave your homes or else you're going to die. And, um, that, that stuff, I mean, some people, I think it really ruined a lot of people. It ruined a lot of relationships. Um, and, and so even though it feels like it was only a couple years ago, it also feels like a lifetime ago to me in 2021. Um, but, um, uh, let's talk about some songs, some, um, music. Let's do music first, because I actually pulled up the Rolling Stones' uh, top 50 songs of 2021. I'm not going through all 50, but here's 10. Uh, number one, they say, is Wizkid featuring Thames' Essence. I don't know who any of these people are, by the way, so that's probably a good thing with the way our society has gone, but I have no clue who that is. Taylor Swift, uh, All Too Well, number two. Uh, I cannot stand Taylor Swift. Olivia Rodrigo, Driver's License, number three. Lil Nas X... Uh, Montero, and there's a guy who looks like a devil, uh, Lil Nas X, like, licking the devil on the music video. I'm sure that's a fantastic, wholesome song. Number four. Uh, Lucy Dacus, VBS at number five. Uh, Silk Sonic, Leave the Door Open, number six. Billie Eilish, Happier Than Ever, number seven. I guess I should have read this list first to myself before I'm reading it to you guys. Billie Eilish in the top ten. Uh, Raw Alejandro to Toto de T. Okay. Uh, Adele, I drink wine. I don't blame you. Uh, and number 10, no name rainforest. So, um, if there are some others that you would like to add, if you're a music connoisseur, just leave in the comments and some movies that came out in 2021, uh, things like the first wave dash cam, uh, the little things, the alpinist Godzilla versus Kong. I don't watch many movies, but that was actually a decent one the 10,000 remake of Godzilla, because of course they have zero original ideas in Hollywood, but one night it was just on, I watched it, and it was not bad, um, which I hardly ever do. Separation, 
uh, Night Raiders. None of I have no clue about any of these other ones. The Deep House, Palmer, uh, Lakewood, Hell Bender, Thirteen Minutes, The Unforgivable Lamb, A Mouthful of Air, Intrusion, Pleasure. No clue what any of those are, and that's probably a good thing again with the um, the way that uh, Hollywood is going. But if there's any that you guys would recommend me watching, put it in the comments. Okay. So, uh, let's do Scent of the Day and let's get started on this list. So, um, Scent of the Day is actually an Uncle Serge. Uh, I wore this to work and it's funny because uh, it's turning into a little bit of a fragrance click in a way. Uh, whenever I go to work, some of the guys now make it a habit. What are you wearing? Can I spray some? And I'll just let them spray it right there in the office. So, they all smell like me that day, I guess. Whatever, whatever my smell is. And today, it was La Couche du Diable which literally translates to the devil's bed sheets. So um, you know what they're thinking. And look at the color of the juice, extremely dark. Um, I'm not gonna reapply because I have a lot of experience with this, even though it doesn't look like it. I've ran through an entire 10 mil decant um, and have the full bottle. And so um, so yes, this is, uh, this is a fragrance I have a lot of experience with. And I think it's one of the better newer Serge Luton's. I think La Participe Passe put them back on the right track. And then uh, La Couche du Diable kind of continued that very resinous, thick trend. There's lots of labdanum in here. This is a labdanum oud fragrance. With some other things, I think, um, you know, for La Couche du Diable, I don't think it's possible to really, truly give a proper breakdown without discussing the frankincense. There's definitely a smoky aspect to the resinous, spicy, excuse me, qualities. Um, now I wish I had that water. But um, but it is, I think, full bottle worthy. If you can find this for, you know, 60, 70 bucks, it's a steal. Go for it. Uh, sometimes you'll find those Surges discounted. The only new bottle of Uncle Surge as well. All my other ones are vintage. So, um, but yes, I, I do think that Surge does good reformulations from kind of what I've, what I've smelled. There are some differences, but some of those vintage prices are so outrageous. Like you're paying... 10, 20, 30 times what retail is on some of those, um, 5, 10, 15, 20 times, you know, and, and for something that's maybe 5, 10, 15% different, maybe sometimes you could just go with the, the new one if you can't find the vintage for a reasonable price. Um, so that's my scent of the day, La Couche du Diable from 2019. Okay, so let's do some honorary mentions and then we'll get into this top 26. So honorary mention, uh, just alphabetical order, Amouage, there's a couple Amouage live streams on the channel. Uh, one of them, or maybe even two of them, are geared towards the women's scent, okay? So, um, for example, uh, Honor 43 is a sample. So these are basically samples that I have in my collection that I have not done individual reviews on, but I have some juice, you know, maybe just a drop or two or a mill or two or something like that. Um, and so I could review them at some point in the future on the channel, or there are some live streams where you can check out kind of my thoughts on them. So Amouage Honor 43 is the first one. That was one of the exceptional x-rays. I really didn't like that one, to be honest with you. Um, I thought if I was going to go that route, I would almost rather wear Amouage Ashore. Uh, I like to shore better than Honor 43 for that floral aspect. Uh, and then Amouage uh, Material came out in 2021 as well. That was um, the vanilla heavy Cecile Zerokian release that was in the women's bottle, but it was the first year that Amouage released their fragrances as unisex. Uh, and so also it was the year of the Amouage Atar kind of big push and they flopped. They're, they're not very good from what I've smelled. Uh, although I will review them if I have the time one of these days, but for me, the king of Atars um, is Sultan Pasha, and he's the one I really want to give my time to, but I do have these Amouage Atars. I mean, I could talk about them. I just don't think they're very good, especially for the price. The price is outrageous. Um, one is called Incense Rory. The other is called Oris Wakan. The other is called Oud Uya, Rose Accor, Saffron Ham Hamra, and Vanilla Barica. Uh, all Atars from Amouage. And um, all nowhere near the work Sultan Pasha is doing. I've smelled them all. They're all mediocre. Uh, but I could talk about them one day. And then, Arige La Doré's Ottoman Empire 3 and also uh, Russian Musk 2 came out in 2021. Um, and I don't own either. I don't, I don't believe. I, um, I looked through my kind of uh, artisanal samples, if you will. I didn't find either. 
um, and and they're not listed on Parfumo that I own that I own them. So those did come out, but they will not be in the list. Although I've reviewed both Russian Musk. I reviewed Russian Musk 1 and Russian Musk 2 on the channel, and I reviewed Ottoman Empire on the channel, and the formula from him is supposedly the same. Obviously, different years, different distillations of certain uh, co-tinctures, or, you know, just if, uh, even if it's the exact same musk pod and it's tinctured a year later, it can smell different. So sometimes there can be differences in smell, but I think those are very, very close. And I've reviewed the Classics Collection from Arige La Dore uh, last year on the channel in 2023, and that included Ottoman Empire 4 and Russian Musk 3, and those were also amazing. So he has stayed true to kind of, um, those have not, I wouldn't worry about reformulations. Like if you just want one, you could buy any of the ones that come available for the cheapest and be fine, in my opinion. Uh, Argos, Dane, Arquiste Poe, Astrophil and Stella, A Night at the Opera, and then they've got another one called Nabati, Bo uh, Bodicea the Victorious, Bodacious, which is a like cherry... Getting on the cherry trend, basically. Um, and there is a Bodicea the Victorious live stream on the channel, I believe. Um, Bortnikov Oud Cologne, which I'm thinking about reviewing tonight or tomorrow. I've been wearing that one to bed a couple nights, and, and it's okay. But we'll, we'll talk about the pros and the cons on the video. Christian Louboutin, or as we say in Texas, Louboutin. Get your Louboutins. Uh, Luby Charm is the name of that fragrance that I have a sample of. Uh, and those are damn expensive, too. Uh, and I don't think they're anywhere near the price worth the price. But we'll talk about that. Digit and Zach, Galia Hind. Galia Hind. Uh, I like the name. Galia. And a uh, good Arabic name. Uh, and Hind, also two good Arabic names put together. Uh, actually, my aunt is named Hind. So, solid name. Uh, and that is apparently one of their animalic line fragrances. So, I'm actually very excited to try that Digit or Dixit and, and Zach. I always say Digit, it's easier, but I think it's Dixit and, and Zach. Um, Rising Mysore 3 came out in uh, 2021. Also, I reviewed Rising Mysore 2 because that's the juice I have, but I think I do have a sample of Rising Mysore 3 floating around somewhere here. Um, but from what people have told me, they are very, very similar. So if you can get one, two, three, whatever you can grab from the Rising Mysore series, grab it if you like that one. Um, Ducita's and... Anamkara and Elisir's Extra Noir came out in 2021. Fragrance Dubois Solstice, uh, Hiram Green's Vetiver, which is a very nice vetiver. Uh, January Scent Project's Atupe, which is like one of their limited releases from 21. Uh, kind of in the same way Chengmen was their limited release for the end of 23. Um, and also Gong. There's a January Scent Project live stream on the channel. There's two. There's one where I actually did like early impressions on the fragrances. And there's one where John Beeble, the perfumer and brand owner, actually came on the channel and we had an uh, interview. Those are some of my, my favorite videos. There's actually an entire interview uh, playlist. So if you want to go through the different people who have come on the channel, Liz Moores of Papillon, Russian Adam of uh, Arige La Dore, John Beeble of January Scent Project, so forth and so on. Sultan Pasha came on the channel. You can go check out the interviews and just watch them all. Um, and we've got Javoy's Fire at Will, that came out in 2021, Mar Olfactif, Sagan Dahlia, and Sun Soaked. That Mar Olfactif brand is like part of the American Perfumer, you know, um, he's done some things for American Perfumer, and he's, a, I think, a Missouri-based perfumer. MDCI's Le Elegant, which uh, I have a pretty decent decant of. I've worn a lot of that. It's not very good, but I'll review it. Pine Ward's Bro Brokelin and Costwald and Treacle. Very interesting brand. I reviewed one Pine Ward fragrance and then haven't reviewed anymore, but they deserve some more time on the channel. Prince Ganja Kasturi, which I'm actually pretty excited to try. Uh, Rogue's Veti Floor, which I have tried, and that's a very good fragrance. Sense of Wood, Ebony and Oak, Leather and Bourbon, Oud in, in Bourbon, and Papyrus and Acacia. Oud and Bourbon is probably my favorite of that bunch. Uh, Slumber House Mond, which um, is a brand that you'll hear more about on the channel. Sultan Pasha's uh, Deer Musk Signature Accord came out in 2021. Towers Cologne du Maghreb, uh, Unique Luxury Beverly Hills Exclusive, which Unique Luxury is honestly one of the biggest shite uh, niche brands I've ever smelled. But if you twisted my arm and said, Ramsey, you have to wear one Unique Luxury, it would probably be that Beverly Hills Exclusive. Uh, they also have one called Crush On Me, which was one of the worst things I've ever smelled. Uh, there's a Unique Luxury live stream if you want to laugh your ass off. 
Wolf Brothers Goat, which I'm actually pretty excited to talk about that one on the channel one day. There's a Zerzhov live stream where uh, I've talked about things like Dekas and Iomi Monkey, Tony Iomi Monkey Special. Uh, and then Zoologist, there's like multiple Zoologist live streams because Victor Wong sent me the entire sample set and I did some live streams where I went through them. Dragonfly, Chipmunk, Macaque, uh, Fuji, Apple Edition, and the Yuzu Edition. And I did a comparison video between the two. Neither of those moved me. Uh, Seahorse, which I did not like. I preferred squid if you were going to go the um, sort of uh, aquatic animals with the house and snowy owl. Okay, so those are all samples from 2021 that uh, I have not done individual reviews on yet. Okay, number 26 on the channel. And by the way, some of these are samples that I just couldn't find or I used all up and, and so, but there are full reviews if it's just a sample. So starting with the sample, number 26 is from the house Astrophil and Stella. It's a house that, here I'll show you some of the remaining samples that I do still have. Um, and they basically are right here. So like, for example, this particular one is called uh, Amber Leavable. And so uh, it's a house that I am not impressed with, to be honest with you. I reviewed the one we're going to talk about today, which is called Patty Shetty. And Patty Shetty is a very sweet, disgustingly sweet um, fragrance that really, really put me off. Nathalie Feisthauer is the perfumer. Uh, it gets compared to a Joe Malone fragrance, but just imagine like an ultra sweet, Joe Malone, um, probably even too sweet for like a modern designer. It was very, very bad. I was not a fan of it. And I know Nathalie Feisthauer does, you know, her style is very synthetic, but this was like a synthetic sweet. There was very little redeeming qualities about this. Um, and it's a niche fragrance. It's not cheap either. So uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm going to give the house a chance and, and do a review on stuff like this. Eventually I keep saying I will, but it keeps getting pushed back because uh, I wasn't impressed. But I feel part of reviewing, it's important to do positive and negative reviews. I just feel like you can't just do positive reviews. Then you're not a reviewer. You're an infomercial, right? And I don't want to be an infomercial. So, um, I, you know, I want this channel to be almost like an encyclopedia where you can go look at the house, look at the reviews, and get my, my true and honest thoughts. Um, and honestly, I'm not impressed with Astrophil and Stella. And that's one of the reasons it's at the very bottom of the list. In fact, it's so bad that it beat out number 25 on the list, which is called Par Parfum uh, de Marley uh, Haltain. And uh, Haltain, uh, the joke about Haltain, uh, one of the guys in the chat said, uh, Parfum de Marley cloned their own sister house, Initios, Oud for Greatness to create Haltain. Uh, that's the joke in, in the community. And, and is it an exact clone? No, but does it smell like Oud for Greatness? It does smell like Oud for Greatness. Uh, years later, at an even higher price tag, because I think Haltain was like a Herod exclusive or something. And I'm just like, my God, man, I've got $30 Latafas that smell better than this. Uh, go watch my review on Haltain if you want to chuckle a little bit. Uh, very, very, very disappointed with, um, with Haltain uh, and Oud for Greatness. I really don't like those fragrances. But uh, like I said, if you want to laugh, go watch my review. The disgusting, one of the most disgusting fragrances I've ever smelled in my life. Okay, uh, number 24, and maybe the lowest amouage ever on a list like this. Uh, this is Boundless. And this is here because there are some pretty big hitting fragrances we're going to come up on. And you'll see as we come up on them why. There is a lot, a lot of artisanal fragrances from 2021 that make the list. Um, and this is kind of the Amouage fragrance that really um, took me all of 10 seconds to realize the shift in the culture of the house. Not just, okay, they released a fragrance that maybe wasn't my favorite. You know, there were some under Christopher Chong that I rated a little bit better than others. Um, but the actual shift in creating something like this, something like this would have never come out under Christopher Chong, ever. Um, this very designer-like feel. And, you know, to be quite honest, it, it smelled very similar to me and still does to a, uh, Tom Ford private blend from 2007. This is 2021. This is Amouage. Um, putting something out that has big tobacco vanille vibes in 21 just doesn't do it. No matter how much you try to dress it up, uh, no matter how much you try to talk about the expensive vanilla in here and all this stuff, doesn't do it. Um, if you want my full review, go check it out. I don't hate this fragrance. But I hate what this fragrance stands for. This stands for the shift 
and amouage to something completely different to a to a uh, market segment that does not include people like you and me. They're not including people that are watching fragrance videos and love perfume. They're trying to kind of grab the um, Gen Z, you know, we're walking through the mall uh, with our Jinko jeans because they're back in style again, looking like they're straight out of a Nirvana video from the 1990s, and they're going to flex because, oh, I just spent 400 on an Amouage, bro. That's the group of people it feels like Amouage is going for, and it's sad because they were one of my favorite niche houses but the, probably the lowest amouage on a list. You usually see a lot of amouages at the top. Now you're going to start seeing them probably closer to the bottom. But amouage boundless at number 24. Very sad. I must admit, though, to be fair, uh, I do like the spicy opening. I like the cardamom. I like the ginger in the opening. Ginger CO2. I like the LME that they used. And, um, you know, I wish I got more of the tobacco and the myrrh. And, and I wish the papyrus was heavier and the cacao and all that stuff. Uh, but really that big dose of, as they say, golden woods, which is like code for amber woods, uh, just really put me off. Really, really put me off. Um, so yeah, go go check out my review if you want to see my full thoughts on it. But Boundless at 24, probably the lowest amouage on, on any of the this year in perfumes, to be quite honest with you. Okay, number 23 is a Dixit and Zach fragrance. And uh, it is called Emperor's Court. And it's my only full bottle of uh, Dixit and Zach. Dixit's harder to say than Digit. So I think I'm just going to say Digit and Zach. Um, but uh, this was actually sent to me by Peter from Fragrance View. So thank you, Peter. Very, very kind of you. Um, and I wore it. I reviewed it. Uh, and you know what? This is like my, my Digit and Zach reference fragrance. Because recently I reviewed one of their scents. It was called Anbar December Edition or something. And it really reminded me of this, and and it uh, almost, you know, spoke to the uh, true to how true it is that some folks were saying many of their fragrances smell the same, many of them smell redundant. You know, if you have one, you don't need another kind of thing. They were releasing fragrances that didn't have very much difference, and you know, when you're spending 130, 150, 200 dollars, whatever it was. Um, you want something, especially for 30 mils or whatever it is. Yeah, this one's 30 mils. So it's not that I don't like Emperor's Court, but many of their fragrances wear very thin, very translucent, like a thin sheen, you know, like a thin layer on your skin, um, like a strip, you know, like a strip, like a piece of paper, right? Like, like the thinness of a piece of paper. It just has that uh, thin quality about it. It doesn't feel like it has the heft, even though it has heavier notes. Like, if you look at the note listing of Emperor's Court, you'll see stuff like um, myrrh and vanilla and tobacco and oud and patchouli. But their fragrances just don't wear. They smell like a tincture. You know, they smell like you're you're smelling the literal tincture. Um, and and so it's not that I don't, I don't necessarily like it because I enjoyed it to an extent. But when I started to smell, many of their fragrances smelled so similar, I started to get lower and lower and lower on the brand. But there are some people that are telling me, hey, stay with it. They did have some stuff that was really good. You just got to kind of stumble across it or switch to the animalic range and kind of, you know, know what you're looking for and smelling. Go for those animalic range lines for someone like you who likes animalics. You'll like those better. So we'll see. We'll see what Ghalia Hind uh, works out, works out as. Okay, so that's number 23, uh, Digit and Zach Emperor's Court. Number 22 is a Centauri perfume that I actually used the entire thing. So I'll just show you the bag that it came in. Um, so this is, and of course there's a hair on it. So this is uh, Centauri Perfumes Anthea. Now, and Anthea was probably my favorite Centauri perfume that I reviewed that you can just go buy right now. I think Shambo is probably my favorite one, but that one's impossible to find. Um, and that was because of all the rare Ensar Ouds that were in Shambo. I think there were only like 97 bottles made for the entire world or something. But of the main line that I smelled that you can just go to Peter Carter's website, Centauri Perfumes, um, and buy, just click buy. Anthea was probably my favorite so far uh, because I really liked the freshness of the citrus opening. There was a beautiful, uh, bitter, sprightly yuzu note. Uh, and I really like the yuzu note. If you've uh, if if you're familiar with Issey Miyake 
Poor, poor Ohm, I think it was from the mid '90s. The, the most popular is Issy Miyake um, for men. That was a big yuzu fragrance. I wore a ton of that in college, and um, I really liked the floral element of Anthea. I thought it was a very well done. It was. It shocked me that I liked it so much. Um, you know, there there are a couple of reviews from the house that I've done. Maybe a handful, like three or four, I think. Uh, so there will be more. I do still have some uh, samples that he sent me, but go check out my review of Anthea if you're kind of interested in learning more, or if you're interested in like a citrus-heavy fragrance that has a that has a thick base. You know, this is not just a citrus cologne. There's a lot of heavier notes in here that start to show themselves: the bourbon, vanilla, the benzoin, the orris, the Indian sandalwood. Um, there's a fruity. There's definitely a fruity side in here, and I said from memory. Uh, that the pink lotus absolute was kind of like the glue. It was like the cement that kind of held the top, that citrusy top, and the heavier bottom together. And he kind of merged it with the pink lotus absolute. I thought it was a beautiful fragrance, very underrated. Not a lot of people talk about on Anthea from 2021, but um, very well done by Peter Carter. Okay, so uh, that is number 22. Number 21 is a Naomi Good Sir fragrance. And it's called Corpus Equus. Now, Corpus Equus is a fragrance uh, done by the great Bertrand du Chaffour. And it is a fragrance that if you just looked at it, you would be like, man, this is Ramsey's favorite fragrance from 2021. But because it's a smoky, leathery fragrance. But the problem is, is there was something about it that kind of put me off a little bit. Didn't click particularly well for me. Um, I liked the fragrance. Uh, I just wouldn't buy a bottle. Uh, and now rumor is it's discontinued, which if that's true, it's crazy. It what lasted three years and discontinued it, if that. Um, so I don't know what I don't know what's going on with the house of Naomi Good Sir, but um rumor is Corpus Equus is discontinued according to Parfumo, but a big smoked. I remember the uh woody, leathery aspect right from the beginning, smelling almost burnt charred. Uh, and so, yeah, maybe there's a strange scent association there. Um, probably they used birch to add that charred smokiness. Um, you know, birch is used a lot in Queer de Russe fragrances and stuff like that. But, um, Corpus Equus could be perfect for, you know, for the right person. But I feel like I have other fragrances that I prefer wearing over Corporate Equus that kind of do the same thing, if that makes sense. So if you don't have a big collection, that's definitely one to try out while you, while you can still get your hands on it. Um, and there's a review on the channel if you want to check out my full thoughts. Okay, another sample is from the House of Diptyque. This one's called O-R-I-L-A. R-I-H-L-A, O-R-I-L-A, so O-R-I-L-A. Uh, and O-R-I-L-A, to me, is a very simple fragrance to describe. It is uh, Diptyque's easier-to-wear take on Tuscan leather. So again, we talked about Amouage doing a take on Tobacco Vanille in 2021. Now we're talking about another niche house, Diptyque, doing a take on Tuscan leather. And if you've smelled Tuscan leather, or uh, if you've smelled ombre leather or anything like that. You just can't get around the comparison there. There is definitely a similarity. Uh, it's got leather. It's got raspberry. It's got saffron. I mean, the big three right there that gives you that Tuscan leather vibe. It's got woods. It's got cedar wood. Uh, it doesn't have that uh, smoky, like cigarette feel that Tuscan leather had. So if you like the bad boy vibe of Tuscan leather, if you like, like the way I describe Tuscan leather is like being in a smoky pool hall, uh, in probably the last pool hall in the, in the state where you can still smoke and people are smoking in there and there's like cigarette burns on the leather couch. And you know, there's ashtrays that haven't been emptied for all night. Cause there's only one waitress who's overwhelmed and all that stuff, you know, and loud chatter, smoke filled air. Cause it doesn't have good ventilation. And you know, you're in that environment and you're wearing a leather jacket and your leather jacket soaks up all that smoke, you know, and you smell the leather and the smoke. Um, and there's a little bit of that. Also that bad boy vibe. You're in the, you're in a darkly lit dim pool hall, you know, that Tuscan leather has that vibe about it. Aurelia is more like you take Tuscan leather, uh, or O'Reilly, excuse me, and you make it more for corporate America, right? So you make it for now Tuscan leather has grown up, he cut his hair, he has a job, and he has to uh, go to work instead of sitting in dimly lit pool halls all night. 
So he can't stay up all night. He's got to sleep. He's got to wake up early. Aurelia is like Tuscan leather for the office. It takes the takes the dirty aspects out and replaces it with cleaner musks and iris from memory. Uh, and pink pepper, very, you know, uh, very acceptable, I would say. But it definitely has that DNA. Uh, and I actually liked it. Like I said, hey, if I owned a bottle, I would wear it. But I think it was pretty expensive. I think it was from kind of Diptyque's high-end line. So from memory, uh, I remember saying I didn't think it was worth the money. But uh, if you don't have Tuscan leather or you are, you know, in an office environment and you don't want to wear... See, I would wear Tuscan leather to the office, but most people would not. So if you're one of those people that want more of an office-specific Tuscan leather, O'Reilly could be one to check out. Uh, okay, so that is number 20. Number 19 is a Guerlain. Finally get to show you guys a bottle. Uh, number 19 is a Guerlain. And this is actually, you know what? I want to spray this because it's been a little while. So let me, I feel like I should have these strips ready, but I never am ready with them. Um, okay, so this one is one I don't talk about on the channel very much. It um, kind of gets, I think it gets pushed to the back burner because it's got this pink coloring and pink uh, juice color, and uh, the name is Rose Shetty. We already had a Patty Shetty. Now we has a. Now we have a Rose Shetty, and um, this is the only bottle like this that I have in my collection. And you know how sometimes I'll say oh, I can't remember if it was Hari or if it was uh, someone else who sent me, if it was Armando or something like that who uh, sent me this bottle. Well, you can't miss this one. This is definitely Hari's. It's got his name in there, um, and. So for Hari, uh, sending this to me, I ended up getting it as kind of part of a haul. And you know what? It was kind of one of those things. He was like, oh, I'll just throw it in. Um, and Rose Shetty surprised me, really, how much I like it. It has this rose water feel to it. So I love rose water. If you've ever had um, Arabic desserts, sometimes they'll use a lot of rose water in the desserts. Um... I have a lot of memories of rose water being blended into drinks, and um, there's an Indian there's an Indian store that opened up close to my house, and they make this. Um, they call it rose milk, but I honestly don't know what it really is. But um, it it tastes like you're tasting like a, like a creamy rose water is kind of what it tastes like. It tastes like they've made like a milkshake, but with milk and rose water and maybe like their version of, of like, um, boba, right? It's not boba, but there are some things in there, uh, maybe different types of seeds. Uh, I don't know what type of seeds, um, but like the healthy different type of seeds that you find. So you get this like creamy, fruity rose. And the reason I think I like this so much, even though it's a sweet floral, even though it's very girly, traditionally girly, let's say. Um, I have no problem wearing this because it has the Guerlain sort of DNA underneath it. So you get that almondy, tonka, um, Guerlainade feel in the base. And I like this. I like this way more than I actually thought I was going to like it. Um, Rochetti is a very interesting rose. It actually, according to Parfumo, it uses Damask Rose and Damask Rose Absolute and Rose Centrifolia Absolute, which is kind of that the big rose. Rose Centrifolia is the big giant rose um, with raspberry that adds a little bit of the fruitiness and Damask Rose Water. So that adds that that's that's where that rose water feel is coming from. Almond, which is like a Guerlain staple. Like if if almond was tied to any house, it would be Guerlain as far as I'm concerned. Um, and Violet. That, that's the official note listing according to uh, Parfumo, but I get a lot of powdery notes. Um, and, um, you know, that sort of creamy aspect to it, like, uh, yes, the rose water feels definitely one, the most rose water fragrance I've ever smelled. Uh, I don't think I've ever smelled a fragrance that harkens to the, the taste of rose water as much as rose shetty. Um, and I like the fact that uh, Guerlain released this as unisex. I mean, obviously anyone can wear anything, even if they listed this for women, it would be no problem for a man to wear it. But I think um, 
if more men tried this, especially if they're Guerlain lovers, like if they know Guerlain and they've smelled some of the old school Guerlain releases and they kind of know the Guerlain odd base, I think they would be impressed with this. So Rose Shetty at um, number uh, 19, number 19. Um, okay, number 18 is a fragrance from the house of Prin. So Prin Lumros is the perfumer. And um, this one's called Varouk. 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 Varouk is on fire. Can't help myself. Um, but Varouk is probably one of the better um, Prin animalic fragrances. I know I give Prin a hard time because uh, I feel like Prin kind of plays the shock value game where he tries to hit you with these animalics in the opening. And the joke is that people smell that and they're like, oh, yes, masterpiece. Mm hmm, indeed. Um, give us more of that shit smelling one, will you? And you know, there's, there's some truth to the fact that I really like animalic notes, but I feel like there has to be a story. They have to be blended well. They have to, all this stuff, right? It can't just be, bam, I'm, I'm, you know, showing you something that, um, that literally smells like it just came out of the inside of an animal. Uh, and, and so with Farouk, I feel like he kind of walks that line because yes, he gives you animalics and when you smell it, if you've smelled some of the other Prin fragrances, you'll be able to kind of make the connection between, okay, this is a Prin style animalic fragrance, okay? But there's something about the way he blended the um, other notes in here that I think kind of changed this one for me, especially the fur note. So there's literally a fur note listed on here, and that can be made up using a lot of different things. Historically, Costas... Uh, can give you like this fur, wet hair, animal type feeling, like an animal that slept on a dirty bed. He used spikenard, um, myrrh, uh, castorium, frankincense, teak wood, Thai oud, which he's a Thai perfumer. He loves using Thai oud, bay leaf, beeswax, pine tar, labdanum, coffee, amber, moss, cinnamon, and leather. So, um, I mean, it literally has this outdoor feel. The um, thumbnail is the bottle sitting on like a desert type setting with the stars kind of in the, in the um, above um, and maybe some like camels in the background or something. And, and, and there is definitely this um, camel, wolf, fur-like thing going on. And I like the spicy animalic resinous aspect of it. I thought this was one of his better animalic fragrances, let's say. If you want to deep dive into it, go check out my review. Would I buy a bottle? No. But was I impressed where I usually am like, not my thing? Yes. Varouk is one of the uh, better, let's say, animalic scents from print, in my opinion. Okay, so that was number 18. Number 17 is a Bortnikov, and it is Classica. Now, um... This was sent to me, I believe, by Scott in Germany. So thank you, Scott. Uh, Classica is a, a 2021 release, obviously, or it wouldn't be in this video. But um, Classica, um, uh, Classica is a fragrance that when you read the copy from Bortnikov, from, from memory, I don't have it up, but I remember him saying something about a Podespania. And a Podespania fragrance literally means the skin of Spain, okay? Uh, or like the woman's skin of Spain. It's supposed to be a reference to a soft, supple leather, right? Totally different from Queer de Russie, totally different from the modern leathers like I talked about earlier with O'Reilly or Tuscan leather, totally different from that style. Um, but uh, so if you are interested in kind of learning about some of the differences, I actually have a video on the channel called uh, Podespania versus Queer de Russi versus Modern Leathers or whatever the hell I title it. But if you search, if you just search Queer de Russi versus Podespania, it'll probably come up. Um, and so this is supposed to be a Podespania, but what kind of threw me off is it has similarities to a Queer de Russi. So it was almost like this weird blend. Uh, and I think that had to do with the birch tar, the castorium, and the vanilla. And if you've ever smelled um, Meleg's, uh, birch tar and Russian leather, which I reviewed on the channel. There's some similarities there with the powderiness and the way it was done. I like Bortnikov's a little bit better than Meleg. Surprise, surprise. Um, this, the note listing is crazy. I mean, when you read it, you would think, okay, Classica, this is going to be maybe like a classically leaning fragrance, but 
it's really harkening back to, it's supposed to be a leather and an oud, but there's no oud listed in the note listing is what was weird about Classica. I still enjoyed it. They, they, um, they categorize it as a woody floral fragrance, even though it's supposed to be more of a leather, but the leather comes across as a uh, very vanillic, um, the vanilla feels very powdery in here. Uh, and so there's bergamot, neroli, and lemon in the top. There's orange blossom, heliotrope, which adds that heliotrope is a very strong flower. Um, if you had heliotrope flowers in the room, it's all you would smell. I mean, they are historically very, very strong flowers. Uh, and so you have to be very careful with how you dose it. I think he did a good job here, but there's iris, sandalwood, frankincense, and may rose with musk, birch tar, castorium, labdanum, vanilla, ambergris, patchouli, rosewood, vetiver, and tonka. So, you know, if you're interested in a um, Cour de Russie meets a Pot d'Espagne meets a classically powdery um, heliotrope can sometimes feel very Play-Doh-y. And that classic powder Play-Doh meets the heavy vanillas in the base um, you know, could, could, uh, remind you a lot of Meleg's, uh, Russian, le birch tar and Russian leather, or maybe even like a strange, uh, Bortnikov version of Le Leon or something like that. You know, it's in that, it's in that range. Uh, and it's good. I think classic is good. Uh, I would not buy this, but if you, if I had a bottle, I would wear it. Let's put it that way. So Classica comes in at, uh, number... 17. Number 16 is a Katana fragrance, interestingly enough, and it's a newer house to the channel, probably within the last four or five months. I've, I've reviewed a couple from the house, and the House of Katana is like a up-and-coming Bortnikoff or Riz Lodori. They're trying to be an artisanal house. The, the chap's name, his name is um, Alp Velio Guliari. Alp Velio Guliari. Hell of a name. Uh, so Alp, I think you're doing a good job, but I, I, my, my personal opinion, if you ever get around to seeing this is work on the dry down because man, when you first spray his fragrances, this one's called Oud Damasina, by the way, when you first spray his fragrances, you're like, this is going to be one of the greatest fragrances of all time. I mean, ever, you know, um, and, and it feels like five, 10, 15 minutes in the fragrances lose that beauty. And it's crazy. I don't know how you create something with such beauty in the opening that just feels to... I've never come across an artisanal house where the ingredients just seem to fall apart like Katana uh, because the opening is stunning, stunning opening. Uh, I don't even know how that's possible if you're using high quality ingredients, but this is Damask Rose, May Rose, and Yuzu in the top with Bengali Oud, Damask Rose, Oud, Ambergris, and Smoke in the heart with a base of damask rose, rose otto, woody notes, and smoky notes. And that, um, it's almost like, um, the, the Uden here is almost like a more animalic version of, you know, like a Malik Al Taif. Like imagine a very animalic, uh, from the Uden when you first spray, but it kind of just falls flat. It doesn't continue. It, man, if that, if, if money is no issue and you could just respray this every 20 minutes, I mean, buy a hundred bottles and respray the shit out of Oud Damasina because it is amazing in the opening. But um, go check out my review if you want more, but more thoughts. But I will cherish my couple drops, spray it on before bed a couple times, and be in heaven for fifteen or twenty minutes, and then you know wonder what happened is usually what ends up happening. But um, a house that I definitely want to smell more from. They're they're not cheap though. They're they're pretty expensive. Um, so that is Oud Damascene at number 16. Number 15 is a, uh, a Riz La Dore. And it's probably the most, I would say, uh, dist or most shit on a Riz La Dore fragrance. And it's called Manly. So uh, Manly, I've come to like. I must admit, I've come to like it. It's in the same vein as uh, Tabak Dore by Bortnikov. My problem with Manly is that I think Tabak Dore is a better version of what Manly is trying to do. Manly is like an easier-to-wear Tabak Dore, but I don't want an easier-to-wear version. I want a more challenging version. But when you hear people shit all over this and talk about how, you know, it's um, 
It's not in a Rouge Ladore. It's not worth the money. That I disagree with. I think it is a good fragrance. Same thing though, I would wear it, but this is probably one of the last Arise Ladores I would spend my money on. I would still like to own some of the others that I'm having a hard time hunting down, like full bottles of Oud Luwak or uh, the Queer de Russie, his Queer de Russie, Russian Adams Queer de Russie. Um, you know, some of those, even things I haven't smelled like Koei Noir. Um, you know, I'd love some full bottles like that, but, uh, they're, they're very hard to find. I would probably take that over Manly, but I like Manly. And if you're a tobacco fan, tobacco, leather, oud, I think you should give this a sniff. Give it a sniff without all of the noise in your ear and judge for yourself. Um, so that's Manly at number 15. And of course it just fell. Get back up here. Okay. So Manly at number 15. So number 14 is a Amouage, and uh, it is an exceptional x-ray, uh, and I don't know exactly where the decant is, but it's Epic 56. So there is a comparison video on the channel between Epic 56 and between Epic, the Eau de Parfum. Um, and I am very lucky to have an older bottle of uh, Epic Woman. I don't know if you can see, but that it says Oman Perfumery LLC. The new ones say Amouage S-A-O-C, Sabco Group or something. Um, so this is an older bottle, even though it's a, it's a um, uh, magnetic cap, it's still an older version, and I love this stuff. And so Epic 56, I thought was a good fragrance. The problem with it is it's competing against what I consider to be a great fragrance. Uh, and it didn't do anything to make me go, man, I want to buy a bottle. I want to spend $400 on a bottle. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it didn't do that, but you can go watch my comparison video and see where there's differences. Are there differences? Yes. But is it worth it for me, an owner of a full bottle to buy Epic 56? No. Now, if I didn't own this and it was Epic 56 versus the new version, maybe I'd go for Epic 56. But since I have this, Epic 56 is just, I'm glad to try it, but kind of move on kind of thing. Okay, so next on the list, we have number uh, 13. And number 13 is another exceptional x-ray, back-to-back exceptional x-rays. And this one's Reflection 45. Reflection 45, I have a review on, on the channel. Um, and Reflection 45 is maybe one of the more uh, interesting exceptional x-rays because it doesn't just smell like reflection man you know it kind of has its own trajectory and its own notes and they it almost feels like you're smelling a true flanker of reflection if that makes sense uh it's much more resinous i felt like especially in the base the myrrh a pop and axe those heavier resinous notes really come out uh and the spices in the top so uh, go check out my compare I, even though it was a review I, it was all, i think it was just a review of reflection 45 uh, now I can't remember if it was a review or a comparison video, but look up Reflection 45 on my channel and you'll, you'll see it. And I kind of talk about the differences between the regular Reflection Man and Reflection 45. Actually, it might be a comparison video now that I'm thinking about it. It, um, it very well may have been a comparison video with Reflection, uh, which I've given a very fair amount of wear to. So... Yeah, Reflection 45 would be, I would have no problem owning a bottle of that and wearing it. And actually, if I was going to spend my own money on one of the exceptional x-rays, uh, I think that would be it. I think that would be it for sure. Uh, that, that one impressed me. Uh, and I think Lucas Swizak is a good perfumer. So that's Reflection 45 at number 13. Number 12 is another Amouage, and it is Opus. Uh, 13 Silver Oud. So Opus 13 Silver Oud, I sampled, I reviewed this off of a sample, I liked it enough and went and bought a bottle. And what I like about Silver Oud, well, it's interesting because um, Amouage released a fragrance called King Blue or something recently. It smells like a toned down version of Silver Oud for me. I like the amped up version. I reviewed King Blue, was not impressed. Um, but I like the, um, I like the fact that the, the Cipriol in this and the Oud kind of blend together with this Castorium note and the Castorium note makes it feel 
animalic and rough and tumble from the get go, and and it adds that leatheriness. Uh, and so I don't, you know, it's a very smoky take on oud. You get a lot a lot of the smoke from the Assam oud. Birch adds to the smoky feeling. I talked about birch earlier being a, a note that's uh, very popular in Queer de Russie and smoky fragrances. Um, and so I think this is one of the better releases under the Fishman. This, and probably if you said, Ramsey, you can buy like, or you can own one or two fragrances from the Fishman's reign that you don't own, it would be Overture Woman. That one really impressed me. But the other one is the other uh, opus that he did, Royal Tobacco. Royal Tobacco is full bottle worthy to me. Um, I have a decant. Every time I try that decant on at night, I like it more and more and more. I think that is a full bottle worthy fragrance. Um, so anyways, that's Amouage Silver Oud at number 12. Number 11 is an Orto Parisi. And interestingly enough, um, very interestingly enough, this shares similarities with Silver Oud. So honestly, Silver Oud could have gone first or this could have gone first, but uh, the uh, guy that owns this house, Orto Parisi, and also Nasomato, he owns both, both houses, Alessandro Gaultieri, he doesn't publish notes. So um, to my nose, there is a definite Oud leather accord, which I just mentioned the Castorium and Silver Oud. There's definitely this Oud leathery, smoky accord, but he does it in a little different way. And I really like the way that he uses um, some of these materials, which many might be might consider uh, like amber wood type materials. He uses them in a way that I've never smelled before. And I like the way he uses them. Even though as I'm smelling them, I'm thinking, okay, these are probably amber woods. He uses them in a way that is amazing, shocking to me. And I love the leather in here. I mean, if you just look at how, how thick and tough I mean, this leather is just like, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it is thick, right? It's, um, it's like, imagine if a Sharpe was, uh, was, was made of leather. It is just, uh, it's a thick leather and, um, and, uh, you know, that's how it feels when you wear it too. The leather just feels so thick. I love it. Love Quoium. Good stuff. Um, so I'll review that one of these days at, uh, number... 11. Okay, top 10. So top 10, I'm going to tell you right now, there's a ton of ouds and artisanal fragrances in the top 10. That's just the kind of stuff that I've been wanting to wear that I've been reaching for lately. Uh, and at number 10, we have an agar aura fragrance called Lao Gold. Lao Gold was a very impressive oud. If you go watch my review, I, um, you know, I don't think I really was if you watch my review, I'm like, I'm not an oud head. And then over these last couple of years, I think I've turned more and more into an oud head, to be honest with you. But Lao Gold is a Lao a, a oud from Laos, which many of those Laotian ouds are extremely animalic. Uh, you're going to see one very close to the top of this list, actually. But um, this particular one is a little bit different. Maybe that's why they call it Lao Gold, because it has all these different facets. Um, you get the green aspects you get something that almost smells like iris that comes out uh it, to my nose you get floral aspects uh and you know it doesn't have that big animalic like um fertilizer chips barnyard fecal smell whatever you want to call it doesn't have that it's actually a very wearable oud and i know that the owner of agar aura uh taha likes scents that are cleaner in in um, in style. And this kind of walks the line. It, it gets very close to having some animalic ingredients, but, um, it also gets very close to being a clean oud. So it kind of goes back and forth. Sometimes you smell it, it smells more clean, sometimes more resinous, more floral, more green, more, um, more iris. That iris note is very impressive in, in um, in Lao Gold. So number 10, Lao Gold. Uh, number nine is a fragrance from the house of Andy Tower. And this one's called Sundowner. Sundowner is another one that really grew on me. I remember when I, uh, someone sent me a decant, very generous decant, and I wore it and I was like, you know, this is really good. I just don't know if I would buy a bottle. I have, you know, fragrances that kind of do this already. And actually, if, if you want my honest take on it, um, Sundowner smells like what Boundless probably should have been. 
uh, because it uses tobacco, just like Boundless said it did. It uses cacao, cacao absolute, just like Boundless said it does. Um, and this is the way it should have been done. I think this is one of my favorite modern tobaccos. And, you know, it's a tobacco mixed with tonka and cacao and vanillas. And so is it a tobacco vanilla like I was giving Boundless a hard time for? Yes, but it's done. Andy Tower does it in such a quality, classy way. I mean, I'm reminded of things like scarecrows, fall coming, pumpkins, um, you know, that red sun setting on those fall nights. It's, um, there's something about that spicy orange zest peel that almost gives you a little bit of like this apple cider, you know, it really gets you in the fall mood. This is a perfect fragrance for fall. Look at the colors. I mean, that, that really speaks to how the fragrance is. And, and of course you have that Andy Tower ambergris, which I think is a, a cord he created to smell like ambergris. I don't think it's real ambergris, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, and I'm just, I mean, this, this one has grown, has been a serious grower. More and more and more I wear it, more and more and more I love it, but it's really like a fall, I mean, this could be a fall staple. It could be a fall signature scent for someone uh, who doesn't have a big collection. Okay, so that's Sundowner at number nine. Number eight is a Frederick Mall, and interestingly enough, uh, it used to be called Synthetic Jungle, but it's no longer called Synthetic Jungle. It's now called Synthetic Nature. So apparently there was like a copyright issue, or I, I don't know the whole story, but uh, I like Synthetic Jungle better than Synthetic Nature. Um, but uh, it is what it is. It's just a name. People were hating on Synthetic Jungle when it came out, so maybe they'll like Synthetic Nature better. But uh, this is a green fragrance that harkens back to the days of the green scent from the 1970s. If you know your Chanel number 19s, if you know your... Um, if you know your Estee Lauder private collection, okay, this is, oh, fuck, man. This is, um, <laughs> this is the pure fragrance spray. My God, man. And, and I can completely see why Anne Filippo and uh, Frederick Mall wanted to create a green fragrance and used fragrances like private collection as like a, um, blueprint, if you will. But they did it in a Frederick Mall way. Green floor. I love the bitter greens that open up. You know, a beautiful execution of Lily of the Valley. Like, if you want to study Lily of the Valley in a modern fragrance, this would be a good recommendation. In a vintage fragrance, there's a lot of amazing Dior's uh, that use Lily of the Valley. Um, but this green crisp, the, the key word here is crisp crisp green uh and patchouli basil jasmine black currant adds a little bit of fruitiness hyacinth uh and ylang ylang are the notes and i think that they just absolutely knocked it out of the park i think a lot of modern noses you know when you see people leave a comment like oh it smells like hairspray or the worst frederick mall i just don't think they understand fragrance history and i don't think they're used to that green fragrance green is most people, when they first come into the fragrance game, they don't like a couple scents immediately. They don't like green, and they don't like vetiver, which kind of go hand in hand. But vetiver is an acquired taste, as are green fragrances. And um, I think for someone who has been around the block and who, um, who has seen uh, kind of things that happened in the past in the fragrance world and lived through the 70s or is familiar with what happened in the 70s, I think they would love this. This is, I mean, if money was no issue, I would own a bottle of this. And there's something, there's something dirty in its, in its crisp cleanness. There's something dirty about it somehow. Um, I love it. I love um, Synthetic Jungle. You can go check out my review or Synthetic Nature, excuse me, if you would like. Uh, okay, number seven. Number seven is a Papillon fragrance, and this one is called Spell 125. So Papillon's going to grace us with a new fragrance this year, which I cannot wait, called Epona. Um, and uh, I have had a chance to smell it. It is amazing. But um, Spell 125 is also amazing. It's white ambergris, Siberian pine, black hemlock, green sakura frankincense, ylang ylang, and Indian sandalwood. And... I mean, she does not make a bad fragrance, period. There is not 
in her entire, I would own every single fragrance from Papillon if money was no issue. I'd own them all, honestly. Um, she is one of my favorite uh, niche or modern uh, niche perfumers. And um, if you've smelled things like, uh, for example, Arso by Perfumum Roma, or if you've smelled something like, uh, for example, this little bad boy, Fila Nagil, right? That'll kind of get you in the ballpark. It's one of the reasons I never bought a bottle of Spell 125, is they kind of remind me of, the, of those two fragrances, which I have full bottles of both. But Spell 125 uses even more ambergris, uses more white ambergris. The Indian sandalwood is amped up. But the green aspects do remind me a little bit of Fila Nagil, but it's a fantastic fragrance. Spell 125 is, is like if you want to study ambergris, Spell 125 is one to study. And the next one is number six on the list, which is Ombre Supreme. And I just reviewed an ambergris heavy fragrance yesterday called Pheromone Porome from La Via del Profumo. Uh, and I mentioned Ombre Supreme as like a reference ambergris scent. Uh, and... It's so good. I mean, it is just the sparkly, uh, you know, waves catching every glisten of sunlight, like confetti. You know, the waves just catch every little glitter of sunlight. And um, the amber, the ambergris in here, it, I, I said this yesterday on my review, but it's true for Ombre Supreme as well. If you want to study a, a particular note, like if you're someone who's moved on from panty dropper lists and compliment list. I got 12 compliments in one day while wearing, you know, if you've moved on from all that stuff uh, and you and you want to study ambergris, this is one you have to sniff. Um, this and there's actually there's three ambergris fragrances on this list from 2021 that I would heavily recommend that you smell. Um, if you want to study what real ambergris does in a perfume. I, I, I've often said that it it creates this holographic like effect like um you know um it shines a spotlight on the other note on the other notes and leaves shadows and holograms and it's a very special ingredient very very special ingredient most times when you see ambergris in a fragrance today you're not smelling real ambergris you're smelling some salty ambroxan that the brand created that's real ambergris and in spell 125 real ambergris someone asked Liz Moore's during my interview with her they said what is the fragrance that uses the most ambergris in your collection? She said, oh, without a doubt, Spell 125. It's not even a question. Spell 125. So, um, number seven and number six. Uh, Spell 125 and, and Lesson Demo Dabla's Ombre Supreme. Number five is an Agar Aura fragrance. I am in love with this. I would love a bottle of this, but uh, it is so, so expensive. And I don't know if you can see just how thick that is, but it is like, I mean... It's like honey. It's so thick. Uh, this is called Kemer Kinam by the House of Agar Aura. And this is a fragrance that really opened my eyes to Kinam. And then, of course, Russian Adams, the history of Kinam Oud really got me there. But um, this uses Cambodian Oud. And the, the, the thing that really struck me with this, there's an entire backstory I go into during my review. But I say, you know, most... Kinam fragrances do not use real Kinam. Uh, they, they try to approximate the smell of Kinam. And Kinam is supposed to have this um, almost cloudy, minty, sort of um, airy freshness to it, okay? Um, the blurb on this is hilarious. It says it has this honey nut Cheerios with milk smell. <laughs> and... If you say that and then smell it, you'll see exactly what they mean. But it's woody, it's smoky, it's high quality oud. You know, Kinam is, I used to think it wasn't my thing. I'm liking it more and more and more. And if you want to understand really what Kinam is, Kinam is very complex. If you want to truly understand Kinam, search out my uh, Agar Aura Kemmer Kinam review. And um, I go through the whole backstory of Kinam and what some people think it's a heart, you know, the heartwood and how long that it has to, uh, be a, be a tree and, and, uh, be infected. And, and the, the numbers vary widely. There's, there's a lot of backstory to Kinam, but, um, Kemmer Kinam is, is amazing at number five. Number four is in a Riz La Dore, which I didn't even grab, 
Uh, and because I don't know where it is, actually, that's why I didn't grab it. But it's here somewhere. I've done a review on this one on the channel. You can check it out. It's called um, Atlantic Ambergris. And I actually, I have the first one. Um, so I have the first one. Uh, but there is actually Atlantic Ambergris 2. Rachel sent me a, a decan, and I still have it. I just don't know where it is. It's here somewhere. Um, yeah, Rachel sent me a decan, and of course... Aha! Look at that. It was meant to be. So, Atlantic Ambergris Part 2. And I reviewed this on the channel. These are so close, Atlantic Ambergris 1 and 2, that I would tell you whichever one you can get at a, at a decent price go for it. And if you want to study real ambergris, this is one of the fragrances to grab. Now, I will tell you this, this is a very spicy version of an ambergris fragrance. It's not as light and ethereal as Ombre Supreme. So Atlantic Ambergris uses a lot of nutmeg, uh, a lot of um, clove. So a lot of these spicy cardamom, a lot of things like that come out. It's a very spicy take on it, on an ambergris fragrance. And there's other, there's a lot of notes in here. Violet leaf, apopanax, cypriol, which is nagarmatha, orris root. Uh, and, and he uses Irish white ambergris, from my understanding. Um, he uses Irish white ambergris. Um, and let's see. I had the blurb pulled up here. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, I don't have it. Okay. Let's see if I can just get it really quick. Um, one thing that he talks about in Atlantic Ambergris 2 video that he actually put up on the Arige La Dore website is he talks about how hard it is to uh, work with real ambergris because he said, even if I use ambergris from the exact same chunk, the exact same hunk of ambergris that I bought. Even if I tincture it a year later for Atlantic Ambergris 2, it'll smell different than the first time I tinctured it. Using the exact same ambergris and the exact same uh, percent in alcohol. Let's say it's 10%, whatever it is, 5-10%. Um, it'll smell different. And, and that's just because ambergris is constantly changing. Um, and if you tincture it and then let it sit, if you say, okay, well, I'm going to tincture a lot of it then and let it sit, it still smells different a year from now. So, um, you know, he talks about how rare and mysterious the fragrance is, uh, how most it's basically absent in large scale modern perfumery replaced with synthetic alternatives, uh, or lower quality gray and black ambergris, which have an unpleasant animalic aroma. So the high the high quality white ambergris, he says, smells pristine, fluffy, silky, slightly powdery, sweet, and earthy. I would also add musky to that. There is definitely this musky, ozonic-like feel to ambergris. And the depth is truly unique. Agreed. Um, so it adds this 3D effect, this spotlight, uh, shadows, and holograms, right? That's, that's ambergris. So Atlantic Ambergris 2 at number four. Number three is a... Bortnikoff, which I forgot to grab the bottle of. It just hit me. I forgot to grab it. Uh, it is under lock and key, but I have reviewed it on the channel. You can check it out. I have a full bottle, too. It's just under lock and key right now. Um, but go check out my review. It's I think it's jumped to my favorite Bortnikoff, honestly, after my reviews and everything and really comparing them one by one and doing the full reviews. It's my favorite. It's called Lao Oud. Uh, Lao Oud is the most animalic uh, Bortnikoff fragrance. It is the one... You know, somebody wrote me the other day and they were like, man, I got um, I got this Bortnikoff and I really, really like it, but I expected the Oud to be even heavier and animalic. And I was like, dude, you got to get Lao Oud. Check out Lao Oud if that's what you're looking for. Uh, Lao Oud is like a Bortnikoff done by Russian Adam. Like it really feels like an Aris La Dore in a Bortnikoff bottle. Uh, it's that style. It's a style of... Um, uh, of a Riz Dore with the heavy oud in the beginning. The oud is very animalic and Lao oud, and it's mixed with things like coffee, birch tar, Peru balsam, beeswax, cacao. So it is a chocolatey oud, um, but it's very animalic. The most animalic uh, oud in a Bortnikoff bottle I've ever smelled. Uh, I also really liked the animalic aspects of Triad, but I, I don't even think Triad was as animalic as Lao oud. So Lao oud at number three. Number two 
is um, one of my favorite Arizladores that I have been loving more and more and more, and I'm sad I only have a Discovery Atomizer. I would love a full bottle. This is called Chinese Oud, um, and I have just fallen head over heels for this. This is so, this could be a signature scent for me. It is so unbelievably good, and it starts off so smooth. One of the smoothest woody fragrances you'll smell. And I think a lot of people mistake that smoothness with this vintage orange aldehyde in the beginning, um, and I don't feel like they really let this bloom. This is a scent that needs time to bloom. It has an earthy quality. The oud has this mushroom earthiness to it. If you smelled the history of Chinese oud by Arise Le Dore, you'll get that earthiness right there, front and center. Here, it's sort of hidden a little bit behind this uh, entire composition that he built. So it's orange, it's aldehydes, it's bergamot in the top, and you get this vintage feel. But he, he blended it with, because this is a very rare Chinese oud, he blended it with... Um, Chinese Rose Otto. Um, he blended it with, uh, let's see if I can find really quick the actual correct blurb. Okay, so he blended it with um, uh, Rose, Jasmine, and Gardenia, all of which were grown and extracted in China. So this is a wild Hainan Agarwood oil from 2004. Wild. You don't find very many wild ouds anymore, unless they're in like vintage collections, right? And a bouquet of extremely rare and pure natural florals, which we talked about. And the base is old Mysore sandalwood. And there is definitely this vintage feel between the orange aldehydic top and the, the smooth Mysore sandalwood base and the oud in here, which takes a while to heat up. I mean, this oud, I feel like, needs time and warmth on your skin. You have to be moving around and doing something. Sometimes I'll spray it, and I won't get the animalic aspects of the oud for hours later. You know, it'll just, it takes a bit to warm up, I really feel like. And, I mean, I am um, I am so impressed with this release. I love this one. It's, uh, it's a special. I've never smelled an oud that smells like this before, ever. Um... It is, uh, it is very unique as far as, as far as I'm concerned. So Chinese Oud, he also did a, um, he also did a Chinese Oud 2 in the Classics Collection, which I thought was also amazing. So you have a chance to get one or two. This is the first one from 2021, but part two came out in 23. And finally, finally number one, and what do you think it is? It's my new wish list, um... My uh, my wish list fragrance from Arise La Dore that I would love. Either version. I really want the first one. But this one would work as well. It's called Oud Zend. Z-H-E-N. The original uh, was Oud Zen. Z-E-N. So this is like the second version, if you will. Um, but Oud Zen. Z-H-E-N. Uh, is basically a Oud... Indian, Indian Oud with Indian Saffron, um, Tolu Balsam, Myrrh, Castorium, Civet, Sandalwood, and Vetiver. So it sounds like a very uh, simple fragrance, but for somehow the way that it all kind of uh, blended together for me, and the way you get that lava-like, ambery undertone with the heavier Castorium. So the way he describes it is gentle, and balsamic and silky smooth oud volcano um, with the smoky side of the oud, but also with that ambery undertone, that sort of, um, that depth, that heaviness. And um, I, I mean, if you said, Ramsey, you get one Aris Dore right now you don't have in your collection, it would be the original oud zen. This is the closest thing you can get. I would still take it. Um, Oud Zen, Z-H-E-N. It is, um, it's really something. Really has this one grown on me. I really think that for my taste with the animalics and the way that he used the castorium in here, this is like his version of a animalic take on like that Russian Oud DNA with that lava ambery style that he's so popular for but with even more funky oud, animalic Indian oud, and the castorium blends together. I mean, he says mysterious, luxurious, 
challenging, blended like a poem. I mean, all of those things I would say are true. So, you know, very rare ingredients and um, just the way the Oud's release on this. It, I'm in heaven when I wear this. So Oud Zen from 2021, my um, number one fragrance of the year. Uh, and I have a review on the channel. I don't think I appreciated it as, it as much then as I do now, but that's my take. I appreciate everyone watching as always. Love all you guys. Thanks for watching. Cheers, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.